And um, I just want to say hello to folks. I'm one of the staff advisors in anthropology. If you're an anthro major, I may have met with you at some point. Um, if you're not an anthro major, welcome. Um, we're happy to have you here as well. It'd be great if folks could, um, if the students who are here could, you know, maybe just introduce yourself briefly in the chat, your name, your pronouns, um, and what major you're at, just so we can get a sense of you know, who's in this virtual space. Um, and we'll pass along to our panelists and we'll, let's start with um, Chris. Hi, I'm, I'm Chris Darwin. I'm a professor in the anthropology department. Um, my area of expertise is uh, osteology of um, animal bones and human bones. I started out actually uh, focused on human remains with the actually the the goal of wanting to go into forensic anthropology um but i'm from canada and we don't have a lot of murders uh so so there really wasn't a lot of uh, uh need for someone to be out identifying uh skeletal remains uh plus the cold tends to preserve things really well so they go directly to the medical examiner um and uh, and that's kind of what shifted me to working with animal remains, uh, but I've still been called out to, um, you know, assist with finding um, potential uh, buried individuals, um, and I'm also interested in uh, decomposition and how that affects bones and what you can see on bones in terms of things like cut marks and, um, uh, you know, pathologies and wounds and things that could potentially tell you something about both how the person lived and how they potentially uh, died. So um, I've been, I've taught classes on um, uh, called Bones, a freshman seminar just, just to introduce people to the topic of forensic anthropology and bust some of the myths from the TV series Bones, uh, as well as um, teaching uh, a kind of a broad um, human osteology course for the forensic science graduate group, um, just to give them kind of a general introduction as to what human osteologists can and can't do. Um, and I will pass it on to the next person. How about Brenna? And then we'll do Glendon and then um, Ashley. Hi, my name is Brenna Hen. I'm also a professor in the anthropology department, as well as affiliated with the Genome Center here on campus. So I'm a human geneticist, which means that I take DNA samples from individuals and then I analyze them to look at how diverse populations are and where people are from. Um, but my connection to forensics is, is a little bit different. Um, we, we had a project where um, we were asking whether or not you can predict somebody's age given um, a type of DNA modification which occurs called methylation. And so um, if, you, if you capture this type of, of uh, DNA modification, then actually you can do a pretty good job of predicting somebody's age. And then this is clearly something which can be uh, really useful for profiling um, either victims or suspects in the context of forensics. Um, and so that's kind of how I got into um, this area. And, and we have a, a special kind of focus in my lab is thinking about diverse populations. So not just European descent populations, but populations globally. Yes, and um, my name is Glenn Parker. I'm an adjunct associate uh, professor in uh, the Department of Environmental Toxicology. Um, I, my interest is uh, from a results from a history in uh, proteomics research. Uh, I've developed uh, a way to interrogate proteomics databases to look for uh, single amino acid variants that were the result of a particular type of genetic variation called non-synonymous SNPs. So these are Variants, we all have a lot of SNPs. Uh, it's probably the basis of a lot of what Brenda's work is. Uh, and so a very small subset of those actually change how proteins are put together. And so if we can detect those changes, when we look at the protein, we can actually then infer what their genotype is of that particular type of genetic variation. So just like any 
type of genetic variation, you can use it for human identification. You could also use it for ancestry because a lot of the uh, frequencies that these show up in different populations is quite different. And so you can actually see that if you get enough of these markers and you could get developed likelihoods that someone is from one population as opposed to another. So that's sort of one, you know, that's something that would be useful in a forensic context. You could use it on degraded samples where uh, there's no DNA present in the sample or left in the sample, or you may have a partial DNA profile, but not a full one. And you could also uh, use it for intelligence, uh, uh, help investigators uh, by, I guess, by actually linking and developing a statistical measure of identity uh, between someone and a piece of evidence. The other thing I look at is also um, sex estimation. So there's, uh, in proteomics, there is, um, is very sensitive and you can detect proteins at very low levels. Um, in the human enamel, there is, and in the, the enamel of all, almost all mammals, there's a set of proteins that are expressed called amylogenins. So there's not a lot of protein in enamel. In fact, it's the least protein dense um, tissue in the body, but it's the most robust one. And often the very last tissue remaining uh, often in some contexts. And so you could actually take uh, one of these uh, pieces of enamel from a grave site and you can use it to actually uh, estimate what the sex was of that individual. And so that would also be very relevant in a forensic context as well. So there's two of the things we're working on. There's some others as well. And my general area is sort of, my general interest is sort of comparing how that is going with, um, or comparing, I guess, how proteomics and genetics and taphonomy or the process of how bodies decay, how all those three come together and interact with each other. Hey. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashley Hall. I am the director of the Forensic Science Program. Um, my area is DNA. My uh, lab primarily focuses right now on touch DNA. That is, can we get DNA from um, fingerprints that you've left, from uh, samples you've left by casual contact, and how can we use that information to better describe what's happened at the crime scene? Um, I teach the DNA classes in the program, um, and I am so happy to see so many of you here today. Um, I love to see everybody. I love to see so many people interested in a career in forensic science, and I really hope we can help talk to you about forensic science in general, but also maybe make you think about um, looking at our program. All right. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, so let's get right into the meat of this. Um, and uh, I think anybody can just, or any one of you guys can just answer the questions as you feel comfortable. Um, yeah, so let's start with um, for students interested in going into forensics. Uh, what uh, undergraduate courses would prepare them to enter this sort of field? I think this is a question for Ashley. Mm -hmm. I can, <laughs> okay, I can tell you what the prerequisites are for our program, and it's um, the same for any graduate program. Um, you need to have a year of general chemistry, year of organic chemistry, year of physics, year of calculus, um, and definitely statistics, because when you get into grad school, you'll be taking higher level statistics, so you need a really strong base in things like probability. Uh, we deal a lot in probabilities. You should also, if you're interested in coming into DNA, look into some um, biology classes, get some molecular biology and genetics. So it is your general chemistry courses that you would think of going into any um, science graduate degree. Can I ask a follow-up question, Ashley, just because I'm curious when advising students, does it matter what... Um, sequence of organic chemistry, like if they're doing it here at UC Davis, the eight series or the 118 series, does that matter or just having OCHEM in general? 
Um, it needs to be the series that has an attached lab. Okay. And is it something where if a student realizes they want to pivot into this, but did not do, you know, those courses at Davis, like doing the equivalent at community college, as long as it has a lab? Yes, yes. And um, if somebody applies to the program and they don't meet all the prerequisites, they have a little bit of time to meet them. They can meet them the summer before they join us. They can meet them in their first quarter year. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking specifically like OCHEM, or physics, which the anthro BS does not have as part of its curriculum. Um, I know some of the other majors here may be doing that, but we don't require that. So if somebody did like the physics, you know, after they graduated community college, that would be fine. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, Kelly, can I just add that um, we did have a, there was an undergraduate who worked with me in my lab and she wanted to go to the into forensic science and realized it too late in terms of that she was doing a bachelor of arts track and so she then graduated with her bachelor of arts did a year of community college and got caught up including in her last year of her undergrad caught up on all of those required science courses and she actually graduated from the uh, forensic science program and i believe she's working at the monterey county coroner's office oh that's great. Yeah, I know that's another question um, that I have from students around the BA versus CBS. And if they don't do the BS, like, is it not really an option anymore? But that's a very helpful anecdote that basically doing community college for, you know, a year um, with catching up with the classes they needed. So can I can I just add so um, on top of uh, the required courses that Ashley mentioned, I also think it's it's helpful to take some lab courses that um, are forensic adjacent adjacent to see if this is the sort of thing that you enjoy doing on an hour to hour basis. Um, so, for example, there is an osteology lab, there's a zooarchaeology lab, I teach a genetics lab. Um, you know, if you if you think you're really interested in forensics and genetics, but then you sit down and you realize you hate analyzing uh, DNA data or you hate being in the wet lab, then, you know, maybe that's not going to work out so well. So I think, you know, on top of these required classes, try to um, as soon as possible squeeze in some of these additional labs, um, many of which are taught in the anthropology department. And Glendon, I know that there's the um, ETOX 20 class. Yes. That's basically the only Lord. No, that's not true. ETOX 20 and we have AMP 56, which is newer, but just start. So those are the two like lower division forensics classes on this campus. But folks should basically, I think, try and do both of those if possible to try and really get a feel for pursuing this. But I don't know if you want to chat more about that ETOX 20 class. Yes, uh, the ETOX 20 class is taught by Matthew um, Wood in our department. And he is, um, and basically the content of this class is that it's a survey of the field and you get a, um, you know, it gives, provides a lot of information about what the career could be like. It provides a context of the history of the field and some of the issues that would be present if you wanted to go into a career uh, in forensics. And it's able to provide some basic um, you know, information in that regard. It's, there is no lab course associated with that, uh, but um, as we said before, like there's plenty of opportunity to do lab courses and the ability to, as Brenna highlighted before, uh, getting familiarity with how to use a prepared and how to sort of create stock solutions and to go through the mechanics of actually conducting an experiment and doing it in such a way that's very structured and reproducible. Um, that is something that you can get a feel for outside of the forensics space in, in, in a chemistry environment or a biology environment. And uh, that would give you, you know, if you wanted you know if that was something that you had an affinity for and you but you also wanted something that was maybe more applied or something that would be 
uh, helping out directly in the criminal justice system. And so that, you know, it's something which could be very motivating for many of you, um, then that's a way that you could proceed with that. So the course, I think it gives you a survey. It gives you an idea of the uh, bit of the history of the field and gives, so, you know, it's a general survey about the ways that it could be applied uh, both in criminalistics and in DNA as well. Those all sound like really good recommendations. Um, yes. So uh, forgive me for a moment, but like, so you don't need to have like, uh, you don't need to specifically be a forensic major. Like, does it matter what your major is? As no, as you take it, those courses? It does not matter. Um, it would be helpful, I guess, you know, to have a feel for it and give you some more information about that. But um, I think as Ashley and others would uh, attest to perhaps more officially than me, uh, you know, if you're getting in, you want to get a, as good a toolkit as possible, uh, that's so that the transition between where you are and then where you, you know, that sort of that learning curve is as minimal as possible between um, actually getting your degree and then moving into a job. And so getting a good toolkit for working at the bench is certainly part of that. Ashley, you might be able to answer this, but I do remember a while back that um, uh, anthropology was one of the only kind of social science degrees that was kind of considered legitimate um, in terms of <laughs> the forensic science field. Uh, and that because there is another Bachelor of Science program and that's psychology in uh, social sciences, but um, it wasn't considered part of the science of forensic science because that was behavioral mm -hmm. sciences, which is a very different field than I think what we're kind of talking about here. Is yeah. that, I don't know if you could expand on that. Yeah, yeah. It's the difference between the behavioral sciences and the um, life sciences. Um, Sci uh, forensic psychology is a very different beast and it comes with different prerequisites. So with that sort of degree, you would not be prepared to come into a science master's program. Um, we absolutely don't require that you have had undergraduate forensics. Um, as long as you've had your science, we'll teach you forensic science once you get here. Um, but they're really cool classes to take. They're kind of a cool way to learn science. You get to learn the, the, the hard science, but you get a little bit of forensics in it. And um, again, it helps you determine if that's what you really want to do. So for our anthropology students, we have a bachelor's of arts and a bachelor's of science. Um, do students have to do the bachelor's of science to get into forensics? Or if they do the bachelor's of arts and take the science uh, requirements like um, on their own, would that still work? Yeah, I think that, that was the question that I answered previously. So Sorry. we had a so Bachelor of Science is preferred. Um, definitely would uh, strongly, strongly recommend that people focus on the Bachelor of Science track because that kind of get and I, what I was giving you was an example of a student who she realized at the start of her senior year, she was like, I really want to do this and I don't have the training and the degree. What can I do? There's no way for her to completely redo her degree. So um, sooner is much better than later. That's kind of a, you know, it now took her much longer than if she had started at the beginning. So my strong recommendation is start with the, go with the Bachelor of Science, but it doesn't leave you kind of out of the, the running if you want to kind of add it in later. Awesome, thank you. Um, so further along that line, you um, uh, students interested in this career, they need to go to graduate school? Um, so the answer is no. To get into an entry level position, you can go with a bachelor's degree. However, let me caveat that. We are trending towards master's degrees. There are a growing number of students graduating with master's degrees and coming into the field to compete with the, for, for the jobs. Um, your typical job gets about 100 applicants and you will be competing with people with master's degrees. So while a bachelor's, bachelor's degree is the minimum, to be truly competitive in the field today, you do need a master's degree. 
Yeah, a lot and, of careers are trending that way these days. <laughs> yes, if, if, if I might um, just build on that statement that Ashley made, uh, which is very accurate. Also, if you have aspirations to lead a lab or to you know move up into management and go on a sort of a more traditional career path, uh, the the cap of where you could go with a master's degree is a lot higher than than with a bachelor's alone. It's not to say it's a hard ceiling, but it is certainly you could go further with a graduate degree than with a bachelor's degree. I think that's probably true for many careers as well. And so to make themselves more competitive, um... I'm assuming that there are lots of uh, internships and opportunities, but can one of you guys uh, speak a little bit on that? Um, sure. Uh, so I've had uh, probably over my over the 20 years here, I've had probably 100 plus um, undergraduate student interns, and they've done a variety of things from prep carcasses and turn them into skeletons and work with um, archaeological materials and analyze them. So I obviously study more dry bones uh, than, than wet stuff, but I have had students also work on experiments with respect to, you know, what happens to uh, uh, bodies pigs actually, um, in wet environments, um, and then other experiments using things like um, FTIR to, to detect whether there's bone changes with respect to ice or frozen environments and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I think that um, wet lab experience, if that's what you're wanting to go into, is definitely um, a plus. One thing I will say is that I used to advertise internships through the General Career Center, and I stopped doing that. And that was because often the students that were kind of coming into that, they were wanting to do like an internship as a checkbox um, and weren't, and I preferred the anthropology students. Sorry, those of you of other majors, it's not, but it was more just that they understood that there was more to doing the little task that I had them to do in the lab than just the task and, and just coming in and doing that task for three hours. The anthropology students were asking me, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this? What's the next stage? So that they understood that it was more than just this little task. And so, and I, and I appreciated that a lot more. And so I've shifted back to only taking anthropology students in my lab with with a very few exceptions. And, um, I could add a word about outside internships. Um, some students do come to us having um, done an internship or volunteered at a crime lab during their undergraduate years. It, it's a minority because those positions are difficult to find. Um, they completely depend on the availability and the willingness of the crime lab personnel. Um, if that's something you're interested in, the best way to find an internship is to um, contact the agency, see if they take volunteers, if they take interns at all. Um, so it may require you casting a wide net if that's something you're really interested in. Um, so, but they're difficult to find, but they are very much worthwhile if you find them. Yes, and also medical examiners labs as well, sort of do other things as well. Um, I think I would add, you know, if you're interested in doing um, a, an internship or, or working in a lab, um, think about doing it for more than one quarter. Um, you know, it's, it's often difficult, I know, for undergrads to put in more than six or eight hours a week. Um, and then, you know, often during finals week, you're not available or things like that. Um, so it, it will take multiple quarters to really gain the types of skills that are going to be um, highlighted on your application when you apply to these forensic programs. So things like, you know, doing uh, PCR or something like you, you're going to need more than I, I know that when I started working in a wet lab, uh, my first quarter, I wasn't able to sequence my own mitochondrial DNA, you know, like it took multiple quarters to learn how to do that. Okay, and then um, beyond internships, uh, what sort of percept? Ah words, sorry, uh, professional associations would 
um, be helpful for undergrads to network with uh, in this field? Who should they be uh, looking to? Well, the, um, the biggest organization is the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. Um, there are student, there's a student, student affiliate membership available. Um, for a student, that's the one that I would start with. Awesome, thank you. Um, and, and also, like also a, oh, sorry. No, no problem. Also locally, there's the California Association of Criminalistics. Um, they just had a meeting here in Reno, actually, which I guess is not on yet. But uh, if you were to think of people who are local in the forensic space, they would tend to go to that one over some of a national meeting as well. So. It would depend where it would all depend where you were hoping to go and practice in a lab. Uh, but uh, the AAFS, I believe, the national organization, uh, they do have some scholarships, do they, Ashley? If I recall right. Yes. Yeah. And then to, uh, oh my internet connection is insane. Can people still hear me? No? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Got one of those big errors popped up. Um, all right, so spinning in different direction, um, can you guys talk a little bit about the careers that students can, um, you know, eventually work their way towards in this field? Well, uh, I'll start out. Uh, I I think I overall in the last um, I would think five years I may have had I think up to about eight or nine students go through the master's program and I've mentored them as part of that, and they've gone into a range of careers. Like the a few have done exactly what you would expect. Um, they've gone into forensics labs. Uh, one was uh, trying to join law enforcement as a police police woman um, but that's not all right there are those who have uh, gone into sales there are those who have um, you know gone well they've gone all across the country really so and I do know that some of my current batch aspire to go into PhDs so I you know there's a, a full range this is after all a graduate degree it's a master's degree in uh, in forensic science and so you could use that for many things not just necessarily to go into forensics if that's what you wanted to do so well um i can i can speak to what our students have have done um over the past five years uh, 54 percent of them have gone on to operational crime labs that is mostly in DNA um, in toxicology some pattern um, and 19 percent have gone on to other graduate or professional school um, and 18 percent have gone into professional careers related to forensic science but not lab work um, and there are a couple we don't know but um our field is really po posed for poised for growth right now. Um, I just got some statistics that I think they excited me. I hope they'll excite you. Um, that employment in forensic science and technology has increased significantly over the last 10 years. 64% um, growth compared to 8% for the average occupation in the United States. Um, and 15% of the nation's total forensic science technicians are employed here in California. So um, that is a very good number considering how many of us there are. Um, it makes your prospects for employment in California very good. Um, there has been very strong gro growth in degree conferrals over the last 10 to 20 years. So the statistics play out what we've talked about that more and more students are getting master's degrees and more and more um, people entering the field are coming with master's degrees. So um, this is an area of strong growth and students coming out of forensic science graduate programs, not just ours, but others primarily do want to go into operational labs 
and they have found good luck finding spots. Um, I just pulled up the uh, alumni um, spreadsheet that I have for um, forensic science students who were working with faculty in anthropology, specifically um, Dr. Hen, uh, also Dr. Erkins, and myself. And so I've got um, a forensic scientist for the city and county of Denver. Before that was um, New Mexico Department of Public Safety Northern Forensic Laboratory, um, visiting research scientists with the FBI, um, senior forensic scientist, uh, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, um, molecular technologist for Keras Life Sciences. Um, one uh, went into a PhD in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State. Um, another one worked for the Police Forensic Sciences, the city of Scottsdale, Arizona, um, and a fingerprint technician for the Oregon State Police. So. And I think I can just add uh, one of my students is working for the District of Columbia doing um, forensic computer work, actually, even though um, when she was doing her master's with me, it was on DNA, but it was a lot of computational analysis. And it turned out that she really enjoyed the computer side of things. And then, um, yeah, so now she's working at the District of Columbia. Is this Hannah? That's Hannah. Oh, OK, great. I was wondering what she was up to. Cool. Those all sound like really interesting professions. Um, and a lot of variety, um, a lot more variety than I thought was gonna be there. That's cool. Um, all right, so another one of our questions is, uh, what is the biggest misconception about forensic careers? Or what was the thing that uh, surprised you the most as you got into this field? Well, the biggest one I see is that it is not like it is on TV. We don't dress like that. I would never show up to a crime scene in a pair of heels. My lab does not look like the ones on TV. It is lit with fluorescent lights overhead, very unflattering, but that's how you see what's happening on your bench. I would love some blue light backlit. Wouldn't that be great? You know, yeah. but um, so uh, they, they to make it exciting, they over exaggerate what we can do. So some of the things they suggest we can do aren't right now, but they are things we may be able to do in the future, but it's not nearly as uh, action packed as what you see on TV. In fact, on TV, you don't see anybody um, uh, doing paperwork, which is a good bit of what we do. <laughs> no, Hollywood is, is surprisingly not always realistic. That's a shame. Bones is a good TV show. Oh, well. Well, I yeah. would love one of those hologram things to reconstruct like they have on Bones. And there was one where they used um, a GPR to uh, go over a concrete. It was and somebody had been encased in concrete and you saw on the GPR this perfect outline of a body. And I thought, oh, my God, they've clearly never seen GPR, which just is these little horrible little ziggity zaggity lines that you have no idea if it means anything whatsoever. In fact, I spent um, a full day dig digging inside a turkey barn uh, because GPR had said there was a, a, a hole there and that we were gonna find the remains of somebody who had been missing. And what we found was that the dripping from the turkey's feeder had created this anomaly in the soil that the GPR detected as a burial. So I'm, I'm, I'm rather skeptical of a lot of GPR stuff after that. It also gave me asthma um, that day. <laughs> yeah, I also think part of the, um, it wasn't forensics as such, but I do remember from the X-Files once, uh, Scully did a Western blot that uh, took a full uh, 30 minutes and looked absolutely perfect. And I, as someone who's done thousands of Western blots, I was rather frustrated by that. <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful to look at and, and took, place instantly like the reality of science is that you have to wait sometimes for data to come about and then you have to analyze it and uh each all of these steps uh have to be done very thoroughly very meticulously and that takes time so. let, let me add one more thing before we go on one thing i see all the time is how databases look forensic databases um on tv you put the sample in and then it draws up a picture with an address and all of this stuff. 
not actually how it works. It's a lot more um, intensive for the technician. The, the, the forensic scientist is responsible for looking at the data and interpreting it. We don't just get given back a, a name, although that would be great. Think about how much time that would save. It would save a lot. Yeah, although I, I guess one thing where these shows are true to life is that you know, it does reflect a lot of what, you know, a lot of these are built on actual cases. And uh, so the actual, you know, the drama comes from where this actually affects like the human condition and what it, insights it can get, you know, you can derive about that. You know, I think that's where a lot of the drama comes from. And that's something which is very real, you know, crime really does take place, uh, bad things actually happen. And so it's quite motivating to try to do our little bit and apply the tools that science has given us to try and interpret and to do our little bit to try and resolve some of these important questions such as who did this? What happened? Who is this person? It's uh, simple, but fundamental. So. All right, thank you. I think that's my favorite part of this uh, panel yet today. <laughs> so our last pre-prepared question, uh, hint to all the students, please, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, because uh, we would love to get to as many of your guys' questions as we can. But our last pre-prepared question is, what is the most important overall guidance that you have for a student who wants to pursue a career in forensics? One piece of advice um, is your background, what it takes to get into forensic science. So um, your entire background is going to be under scrutiny. So don't do drugs. If you have done them before, just stop. Stop now and you'll be okay. Um, these are things that could disqualify you from um, getting a job as a forensic scientist is a police record, um, having done drugs, um, bad credit. Bad credit can also disqualify you. Anything that might compromise you becomes a problem, but there's time to fix it. Yeah, this is, after all, a government job. And so, you know, if you want to make huge amounts of money and be a millionaire, then go to business school, right? This is uh, the advantage of a government job is that it's very secure. It is something that is very meaningful and allows you to, you know, give you a, a true sense of purpose. These are very attractive things. And so I think that um, certainly, you know, what's motivating you? Uh, you know, what is it that you want to get out of life? And what, you know, when you hit 50, you probably may have had a few career changes, but uh, when you hit your, near the end of your career, you know, when you look back, you know, how do you want to feel? Um, and so I think that's all part of, you know, the choices you're making at this point and how they actually can go in, you know, how that could sort of motivate you as you move forward. I was just gonna say, I'm really glad Ashley mentioned that because that's not even um, just exclusive to forensic science. Uh, one of my my friends uh, who's a master's in archeology span was applying for a job uh, for a museum position, uh, and but it's with Yolo County. And one of the things she noticed in there was there was a drug screen test. So she stopped taking those THC gummies. And I said, oh, that can't possibly be the thing because you know, that's, uh, you know that, that's legal. And she goes, I don't want to take that chance that and and so uh so just be aware of that and my son who is just graduated from nursing school at Sac State um even he ha has to be bondable uh in order to work in an ER which means that there was there's a, a background check on him um fingerprint checks and so forth I even had to go through it to become a U.S. citizen or even actually just a resident of the country um fingerprinting and background checks and checking me for HIV and uh, every STD possible. <laughs> like, so um, so there's a lot of invasive stuff that I think a lot of people don't think about when they're younger. Um, luckily, I'm super nerdy, so that was never a problem. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, and my guess is, Chris, you probably don't have tuberculosis either. Um, no, but my my son got it uh, from working in healthcare with uh, elderly in Yellow County here, and he didn't realize he had it. He was asymptomatic, but because they test very you know annually for people in the health profession, they tested him, and then they were like, "You're reacting." Initially, they said, "Oh, it's because you have red hair," and then they went and they said, "Well." You're either going to have to get a chest x-ray every year or we're going to put you on four months of antibiotics. So now I refer to him as consumption boy. <laughs> so <laughs> those in my class already know I've talked about him as TB child. Yeah, so, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sarcastic parent. <laughs> it's, the, it's the Canadianism. It's probably why I get along well with Australians and probably uh, and yes. <laughs> Sarcasm it goes a long way. Yes. It's our coping mechanism. <laughs> Any other questions, Nora? Um, so we do have one student question uh, from Tabitha. Uh, she says, my major only requires me to take the OCHEM lab for the first two quarters and the OCHEM lecture for all three quarters of the year. Should I take the third quarter of OCHEM lab as well to be more qualified for graduate programs? This is probably an Ashley question, I think, but my instinct would be to say the more organic chemistry you do, the better. Right. Every every lab gives you something else. Um, the question would be then, Chris, would we, for our prerequisites, would they need that third quarter lab? I don't think that we required it. Is that right, Ashley? Right. right. That's what I thought. Yeah. So you're, you're always good to take as many labs as you yeah. can. You Absolutely. Go and, yeah. But we would we would, it wouldn't disqualify you from the program, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. Looking at the requisites here, it's organic chemistry with lab six quarter units and two lab units. So. Glad, glad to know that both, both of us I had, had recalled that correctly. <laughs> um, yeah, but I but I agree, and I and and kind of goes back to what Brenna was saying is that you can't get um, experience just doing, you know, three or four hours a week in a lab, in a you know, eight week time span. Um, it's something that it you have to build on it, and and so um, just as if you intern in a museum, uh, they usually ask you to commit for a year. Uh, because they don't want to invest time in training you at the beginning stages if you're not willing to kind of stay for that whole time. So, um, and I know Dr. Irkin's lab is similar. He doesn't want to spend the time teaching you how to drill tiny holes in teeth if you're only going to stay there for a quarter. So for uh, doing research and internships, would you guys recommend you know, trying to get into labs uh, as sophomores, as juniors, as seniors, when's the best time to, to do that as a student? I think that you're, you know what, Brenda, I'll step back, you go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say sophomore is great. The earlier, the better. Yeah. Um, that way we can really develop like an honors thesis with you. Um, as well. And, you know, an honors thesis is basically going to take a year. So then if you join as a sophomore, let's say winter your sophomore year, you start to get a feel for what those lab techniques are, you know, then eventually we can apply for some summer funding to help you like, you know, spend 20 hours a week during the summer and just really, really build up. Um, and then hopefully eventually, yeah, yeah, you have an honors thesis with your name on it. Maybe that's even a publication. And that really goes a long way, I think, both in the interview process as well as any applications for a, a forensics program for graduate school. And I would say that applies um, even if you're not going into forensic science, but you want to go to graduate school just in anthropology in general. Um, is 
is to get in touch with faculty members that you're interested in early. Um, so somebody that you've taken a class with. Um, so for example, students that uh, transfer, they're often at a very big disadvantage because they only have two years. And so you have to hit the ground running um, in your first quarter of your first uh, year of a, as being a transfer student. So for example, I had a, a student who's doing her honors thesis with me right now, and she took my husband's AMP 15 class, heard him say that he uh, worked as an archaeologist, and came up to him right after class and said, do you have any internship opportunities? And she interned in our lab for a year before she kind of came up with, with us uh, on an internship project um, that became our honor thesis. And she's now actually working with Tammy Buenacera, who worked with Glendon Parker and Yalmer Erkins on stabilized stop analysis of some wood samples. And she's going to a um, PhD program with full funding in Kansas. So yay. Yay, Haley. <laughs> I wanted to pop in and say, sorry, Nora, um, just for folks, whether you're in the anthro major or not, um, I'll put this link in the chat, but on our link tree, we have right here, um, and we try and keep this, you know, over the summer, it won't be updated, but every quarter um, we, we keep that updated with real-time research opportunities. Um, and so that's a way that different grad students um, and faculty in our department share out um, research opportunities because we realize it, it can feel intimidating um, to you know, proactively ask folks. And so that's kind of a way to see what's out there to then contact um, the grad students or faculty who are looking for research assistance in their labs. Oh, so I have one last question for the, the panelists. Um, so for our anthropology students thinking about going into forensic anthropology, do they still need to go to like a field school? An, an archaeology field school? Is that what you're asking about? Um, if, you, if you're wanting to go into forensic anthropology, I would strongly recommend it because one of the things that police officers are not trained in properly and often end up bringing archaeologists in to train them for is how to map and document um, evidence. Um, police officers are, tend to be not as meticulous in some ways. And in fact, actually, we um, when I was at the University of Missouri, they would bring in police officers and we would train them in mock excavations for recovering human remains. Um, and although we are not in any field schools here in California excavating specifically human remains. And even in Missouri, it was a plastic skeleton. You're still learning how to, um, to collect evidence and to do all of that documentation, which is essential. So, um, so yes, and for example, um, University of Nevada, Reno, as well as Chico State have very strong forensic anthropology programs. Um, Chico State is a master's degree. Um, Nevada, Reno has both uh, a master's and a PhD level. Um, for students in our department, you can talk to Diana Malarchik, one of our graduate students who went to Nevada, if you want to know more. But they were all out during those fires, after those fires in paradise and so forth, um, with um, sniffing dogs, but also recovering cremains of both animals that had died in that fire and humans that died in that fire. And you need to be able to identify whether a bone is human or not human. And that's only something that you are going to learn in field schools, um, zooarchaeology class, human osteology class. So that's what the field school is for. All right, um, we have one last student question uh, before I think our meeting ends. Um, Braden says, do you have any tips for people in their senior year who might want to change focus? Uh, like the, the student you mentioned previously managed to do. So Br Braden, can I ask you what specifically you're wanting, where you are now and what are you wanting to change focus to? Cause that might help a bit. Are you doing a Bachelor of Arts, for example, and want to switch to a Bachelor of Science or? Um, I'm currently doing the Bachelor of Arts in Evolutionary Anthropology, and I'm thinking of maybe switching to the BA or something because it more fits in with what I'm interested in pursuing after college, but next year is my senior year. 
So I was just wondering if you had any tips. Okay, so you said you're in a BA in evolutionary, but you want to switch to a BS is what you said? It's something I'm thinking about because it more coincides with what I've been interested in. Then here's where, you know, you you might want to because it'll save you money. Um, take uh, some of those lower division courses at community college and get those lower division OCAM courses. But I would also talk to Kelly Scholler, um, who might be able to help you more as far as navigating the system of how to switch um, since you haven't entered your senior year yet. Um, but it is challenging at this stage to do that. Yeah, so if you want to come into the advising office, we can totally help you uh, swap from the BA to the BS and what exactly you would need to do to do that. We have drop-in hours and you can get appointments. And similar to what Ashley said, you know, at the, at the start, um, it sounds like it is possible for folks if they graduate with a BA to still get the preparatory requirements after graduation um, to be able to, you know, pursue forensics grad programs, because there does come a point, I know this is an issue specifically for transfers who maybe start in the BA and then realize maybe as you're doing, you know, Brayden, oh, maybe I should have done the BS, but I mean, it, it would be very difficult without extending probably for a whole extra year to fit in all that additional coursework and then paying all that additional <laughs> tuition at UC Davis versus, you know, finishing with the BA, but then doing um, chem and physics and things that can definitely be done at community college because those are a lower division, basically post-graduation. Um, yeah, so it just is a matter of what makes sense timing wise and unit wise, and if a switch is even possible um, at a certain point. So I think, you know, folks who are in a BA shouldn't feel like, well, I can't, I can't pursue this because I think we're hearing that it definitely is still possible. It's just a different kind of route folks take. Um, for those though, who want to go to uh, forensic anthropology, specifically, rather than the forensic science graduate program, um, many, many of them go with a, uh, a Bachelor of Arts degree um, and, and into Chico State or Nevada and so forth. They don't have, they have a strong anthropology background, strong bone background, but, it, and so it's a very, it's a different type of training. So, um, so it, it depends on the type of forensics that you want to do. It's similar to what we were saying with the behavioral sciences. Um, if you're wanting to go into behavioral sciences, it's a different kind of beast, so to speak, than, um, than the, than the lab-based forensic science that Ashley and, and uh, everyone else have been talking about. Yeah, that's, that's, thank you, Chris. That's a helpful differentiation. But they're still gonna, you still have to be able to rock it in terms of your GPA and those internships and those things that are going to make you stand out because there's a lot of competition to get into those forensic anthropology programs. Mm -hmm. And even the most famous forensic anthropologist, uh, she never worked full time as a forensic anthropologist. She was a professor of anthropology um, and, uh, and then um, kind of did side work as a consultant in Montreal and uh, locally in um, South Carolina. And, uh, um, but she's, she's a PhD in, in anthropology. And so, and that's like, for example, Tim Weaver in our department and myself have had sheriffs come to us going, is this human? Um, and that's but the vast majority of forensic stuff that happens to anthropologists. I do have a question just so we have it as part of the recording, um, because I think it'd be interesting to hear what you each say around what would you consider like the most challenging aspect of working in the forensics field and the most rewarding? aspect. I would say for both of those, it's the human aspect, um, kind of similar to what Glendon was talking about, is that uh, um, you both have to distance yourself. I mean, when I was digging in this turkey barn, I obviously was, uh, I, that was, that was really gross, but I was, you know, we were there because we 
we thought we were going to be able to re recover somebody who'd been missing. And, and, um, and so you have to put aside like the, the smell and the, and all of the gross stuff because you're, you're there to do something to benefit uh, another person, another human being. And it's the same thing, I think, when you're helping out, even if it's just your little tiny part in a lab, um, and you may not think that it may, means much, it may mean something to convicting somebody in a crime or solving something. And, you know, so that's, that's, uh, that's the part of it that I, that I found. Yeah, I would say the same thing, the human part, because you're looking at evidence of crimes and horrific crimes at the same time attached to that is a victim and the victim has a family and everybody deserves an answer. And that's ultimately what our job is to do is to give an answer. And so that's the best part of it and the worst part of it. The, um, I think, you know, when you are starting out in a career, you wanna make a difference and you can make a difference in any field that you go into uh, and you can have an impact uh, massive or minor, whatever. But if you go into forensic science, then that's an intrinsic part of the day. You could have a what might be a boring day in lab, but you could that could be the critical piece that could put someone in jail or could bring back uh, some remains to a family that's grieving for that individual. And so even a, on a bad day, you could really make a major impact. The, um, I think in terms of a challenging uh, environment, I think as with any government job, there is a, you know, a lot of these are government positions. And so in addition to having less fun prior to uh, signing up and applying, you also, you know, you're working for the government. And so there's challenges there as well. Um, and, and law enforcement as well, which I guess is a particular part of the government. Uh, it can be a little reactionary sometimes and, you know, that uh, you're dealing with law enforcement and, and you're on the other side of, of, of things. So it is, uh, that could be a challenge. And I think, you know, in order to, adjust and fit in well in that environment, you do need to be comfortable with that. And yes, things do smell sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hearing y'all talk about like the, you know, convicting folks it also I feel like forensics has been shown obviously to play a huge role in exonerating people who have been wrongly convicted like so I feel like that's pretty huge in terms of benefit to society so that yeah it's probably very rewarding yeah I other, oh go ahead yeah, I, I think part of what you do, regardless of whether you're part of an exoneration process or you're part of a prosecution process, good forensic science helps to maintain the integrity and the effectiveness of the criminal justice system. Like we can all complain about where it goes wrong or where it takes a long time or where it's inefficient. And all of these are real issues that we have to you know, address. And that's part of been in a democracy, but uh, I also think, you know, it would, you know, actually maintaining, if you're a good forensic scientist, then you're working in all ways to maintain the integrity of that system which we all depend on. Well, any other student questions from folks who are still with us before we wrap up? Now's the time to ask any burning questions while you have all these panelists here. Um, and are you all um, okay with having your emails sent out to the participants? Um, 
as a follow-up if people want to individually maybe email you various questions. Okay, great. Run once, run twice. All right, well, we appreciate so much um, to all spending the time to be here with us today. And we'll stop the recording.